Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Design Build Hunt podcast. With me on the line today, we've got Mr. Lee Dixon from Tennessee, Jake Hendrickson from Michigan, and Greg Kazmierski from Ohio. Gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Good to How's see it you going, guys. Josh? Pretty good, pretty good. Glad, uh, glad you guys could join me again. It's it's weird. We we record these in batches, so when I say welcome back to the show, you di- you didn't leave, you didn't go anywhere. We're uh, we're still sitting here, but. But we don't know what order these are going to be going in. So, you know, as of right now, welcome back. And uh, we'll pretend like this is all brand new and fresh. But, uh, guys, we're at the best time of the year right now. I don't know about you guys. Um, are you all are, are y'all the, on the pre-rut rut train? Or are you guys early season guys? Or are you late season? What's your, what's your preferred time of year to, to try to get it done? So I'll go with that one, man. If I had to just pick one week, I'm going to pick, you know, post rut every single time I'm a post rut guy. And I I think this is confused with like peak rut a lot. It's when, you know, you have fewer and fewer receptive does out there and then you just have a, a free for all, you know, bucks start making mistakes, trying to find that last receptive doe. That's when you just see, you know, pretty much every buck on your property daylighting. You will inherit, you know, bucks that you've never seen before off your neighbor's property. Um, that's my favorite time of year to hunt, and that's usually in, in uh, around that first week of December for us Tennesseans. Okay. Uh, so, hands down, post-rut guy. Interesting, interesting. What about you, Greg? Um, I would say for me, whatever my schedule allows for i feel like once i once i start liking early season a lot i start to get really busy at the end of september and the beginning of october and then i gotta hunt the rut and then once i like to do the rut um it kind of switches up and i gotta hunt the late season so uh, I would say for me, it's just, I kind of like to adapt and like this year I got a lot of time in the rut. So, uh, you know, like I went out today and, and hit a, hit a few mile loop, uh, out in the forest down here and just kind of checked all of my winter scouting areas, tweaked some trail cameras, things like that. And, uh, I love the rut just because there's that element of randomness and just like what, what's going on. And, uh, when you do find that like quote unquote rut zone, uh, and you're just in the spot and you got action all day long in the tree. That's, that's hard to compete with. Um, from a strategy standpoint, love the early season, love trying to pick that apart, but the rut just has a certain element of what is going on that I feel like that's what all the deer hunters really love. Right. Right. Jake. I don't know if we can even count Jake. So you were, you're already, you're already tagged out. So I don't know that. I don't think you're a even counts anymore. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, that actually falls into my window of, of my or close to my window of my favorite time to hunt. Uh, I, I love hunting the rut, but like Greg said, it, it, there can be a lot of uh, randomness to it. I, I really like the the predictability of the pre rut, and for me, the which kind of falls here in Michigan, it kind of starts around the twentieth, twenty fourth of October, and then it kind of goes up until about Halloween, and then it, then the, then the rut really starts to to kick off. Uh, I really like that last week of October, the the or last ten days of October, and that's because those are the deer that are using your property consistently. Those bucks that, that you have an opportunity to harvest, and you know those are the deer that a lot of times like you, you kind of have an idea that they're there. You, you know these deer; these are the deer you passed on for the last couple of years, and you know you just been kind of waiting and waiting for these guys to start moving during daylight a little bit more. And most of the time that happens, you know, right around that, you know, the 20th, to the 24th of October, and then you can start making decisions on whether or not you want to go in. Once, once uh, you get into November, you still have opportunities at those deer, it can, but it can get a little bit more challenging. And, and we'll kind of probably talk about some strategies for, for the rut in this podcast. But I really like the, that last week of October because there's a little bit more predictability and you really have a chance to harvest those uh those resident bucks as Lee likes to call them those bucks that are on in on your property or, or using your property on a fairly regular basis right it it does seem to be that if you've got a uh let's see a well set up piece of ground 
right? I, I don't want to call it manicured because that's not the right word. If you've if you've intimate, implemented your your plan, if you've implemented your design, and if you're growing bucks, that last week of October is really hard to to compete with because uh, they're still on your ground. They're still following some of those patterns that they were on earlier. They're still betting pretty predictably. They're still feeding pretty predictably. They're up a little bit earlier in the evenings and a little bit later in the mornings. Uh, and they haven't left your property in search of hot does yet. So, um, yeah, it can be really, really, really good. So, uh, guys, let's let's jump into it. So, this is going to be launching on, uh, I do believe, November, November 1st. Man. No, wait. Sorry. November 2nd. November 2nd is when this is going to launch. So hopefully that means a couple of things. Hopefully, number one, it means I'm in a tree somewhere in Wisconsin. That's that's what I really hope it means. Um, but I hope it means we're all getting out and doing a little bit of hunting. So for the guy that maybe doesn't have a property that is set up yet, maybe he hasn't had somebody come out to do a design for him yet. He hasn't set it up just yet. Uh, maybe it's a lease that he really can't do a whole lot to. What are some of those rut time strategies that you're going to be pointing someone to in that kind of a situation. Go ahead and jump in on uh, this one. This is pretty relevant to me right now, kind of in that process of working on getting my first nice uh, whitetail piece down here. So spending a lot of time on public land right now, um, on permission property, things like that, where I just don't have the ability to really do anything to it except hunt it for what it's for. And I think the biggest thing for me, uh, just because I'm hunting the areas with a steeper terrain, is really taking advantage of those key terrain features that are just going to condense that deer movement. Um, and then it just comes down to getting time in the tree. Um, I, I am a huge believer that you can find a well-positioned pinch point in any way, shape, or form. And if you're going to be willing to do a daylight to dark sit, I have a very hard time believing you're not going to have at least a little bit of action during that first week of November. Granted, you do have to worry about, um, other people when you're out on public land, you know, there is possibility of people coming through, but I've even found at the point where if I can get in and get established set up in a specific terrain feature, I can have people walk through and I can have a deer walk through 20 minutes later. Sometimes it just doesn't matter. Like I feel like that. And that's that element of the randomness that, uh, if you are in a zone that the deer want to use, eventually they are going to come through there during the rut. And I think that's my best piece of advice uh, for a guy that's just kind of out there um, and just putting some stand time in. Right. Right. Anybody else? Yeah. I'll kind of piggyback off that. I mean, obviously everybody, you know, you really like those pinch points, you know, like, like Greg was saying uh, in, in main travel corridors on your property. I love the, a lot of uh, long, this is where you can sit long hours, right? You're hunting long hours. I will say this, this is the only thing I'm going to change, uh, with Greg, like, or add on, I should say, not change, but you know, what kind of buck do you have on your property? Do you have a shooter buck on your property right now? Is he, you know, what is his personality type? Is he more of a resident buck? Does he like your, does he see your property as safe, a home? You know, is he, is he frequent, frequenting your property, uh, or do you not have a target buck, but you still want to hunt the rut? There are two different places that I would target. Uh, Obviously, the main travel corridors uh, that we're talking about, pinch points in those, you can get really laser focused on a resident buck that you've got pattern. You kind of know where your doe families are. You know where he should be traveling to and from. Uh, But if you don't have that target buck, uh, an area that I really like or, you know, pay attention to your main hub system, where would you import or export a buck on or off of your property? Mm. Um, and that's where I like going. If I don't have a target buck and I'm like, okay, this right here is where I import or export 90% of my deer herd onto my neighbors. That's where he will more than likely enter your property. Um, so I spend time in those main hubs like that on and off the property. So pay attention to your DNA, uh, and where those deer are going to travel off. And if, if there's, I really like a, a, a pinch down you know, exit, uh, off the property. And if you don't have that, sometimes you can manipulate that. You can create that. Uh, so those, those are just my little quick tips, but right. long hours. And, and another thing, 
uh, just depending on how, if you got a resident book, you got them targeted. One thing, you know, sometimes I go in a little bit later. If I, if, if you're in like a lockdown type phase where, you know, you know, they're locked down, I'll let them, you know, the does are still going to feed. They're still going to be on their feet. Sometimes I won't even go into my stand until like nine o'clock, but then sit all day. And that way I don't risk pushing them. If they're out feeding, you know, they're out in, in my possible access route. I will wait until they go back into some secluded areas. And then I'm hoping that he is going to leave that herd. You know, he's done with her going to look for another receptive doe and come through my travel corridor. And that's sometimes I'll go in a little bit later, but then sit all day. Right. Lee, you mentioned, you know, you can go in and manipulate that when it comes to some of this movement at this time of year, let's say you've got a property that you, you know, you want to get serious about some habitat design work on it. Um, but it just hasn't happened yet. You're kind of, you're, you're waiting, but you're, you're obviously going to hunt this season. Can you get away with any of that stuff right now? Or are you staying out of the timber when it comes to, you know, trying to manipulate some movement at, you know, when it comes November 1st, right? Yeah, man. I really, I try to get all my work done, all my food plots done, you know, by September. Like, and this depends on your, I, I say that, I don't think it depends on your state, but I think it really you know, increases in importance when you get into states, definitely these Southern states with these long rifle seasons, extremely long rifle seasons, and you've got really high pressure. You really want to, you know, secure that sanctuary on your property somewhere starting in that late August, early September, get all your work done then and stay out of there um, and reap the the benefits of the, the orange army that's going to enter the woods from, you know, literally October into January. I mean, literally it's, uh, it's nonstop. So, right. um, I say get it done early. I don't like going in there right now and intruding on some of these areas. I, and I, I'd say it, it depends on your property's DNA too. If you've got, if you, you know, looking at that main hub, that main artery, if it's not in your sanctuary, then go make an improvement, go, you know, uh, a lot of times it can just be as simple as, uh, cutting down a tree that pushes them closer to where your secure access is within bow range or rifle range, whatever your choice is. It can be as simple as that, but always pay attention to what the deer want to do naturally. And then you can kind of manipulate it in your favor. And, and it's really, sometimes it's super simple, right. um, but very high, it's highly effective. Right. Right. Jake, anything to add on the, on the, you know, rut strategy front for the guy that, you know, maybe hasn't done a lot to his property just yet. Yeah. So if, if you like, I haven't really done any property improvements, either you own the land and haven't done it, or maybe you're leasing property. Uh, I'm going to kind of ag agree a lot with what, what, uh, both Lee and what Greg said with what, what Greg was talking about. And I 100% would do the same thing is I would be looking to see how these deer want to naturally use the landscape because you, right now we're into the rut. We don't want to really be spending time in, uh, on property improvements, that's just going to apply too much pressure to the area that's going to push deer out. So we want to hunt the property as is. So we need to try to look for you know, how these deer are going to move through the property. These, these bucks, they're going to be searching for doe families and the, that next receptive doe. How are they going to move through the area? And if there's ever spots that consolidate deer movement down those pinch points, uh, whether that's you know in, in ag land or, or areas with a lot of topography, you know, those areas that pinch deer movement down, try to find those and then sit as long as you can, because eventually, like Greg said, they're going to move by. Uh, another thing that I would try to do, and this is what, what I we do on our property is, you know, these bucks, they're, they're looking for does, right? They're, they're going to be either with does or when they're done, they're going to look for the next one. And so you need to really find out, you know, where are these does spending time? And it's going to kind of depend on the time of day, what these does are doing. But a lot, a lot of times throughout the day, they're in that thick cover and find out where these doe families are spending time and either set up next to one of these bedding areas, these doe bedding areas, or if maybe find a pinch point that's in between two of them. So if you have a buck that's maybe left a doe from one of these uh, doe bedding areas, he's looking for the next one. You either, you know, you, you can catch him as he's moving to that, to that other bedding area. Um, another thing that these bucks really like to do as they're moving around throughout the neighborhood is you know, they don't just throw uh, safety to the wind. They're, they're still going to be careful as, as they're, they're walking around. And, and so that, that's kind of where you, you, you got to try to find some, if you can, these thick corridors. So this is where habitat improvement can come in to really enhance your property. But if you notice that 
let's say you have a a 40 acre piece it's a rectangle and you have maybe a swamp system that runs through the middle of the property north to west or north to south east to west whichever way your property is oriented you know if, if there's a buck that's trying to get from one side of your property to the other and you don't haven't made any improvements and most of your property is either open field or open hardwoods there's a pretty good chance that that buck he's going to take that thick cover as he tries to sneak his way through because yeah if for some reason like you don't have does on your property at that time you know he's just going to travel through it but try to find the location that he's going to travel through and he, he's still going to take security into account he's still going to be you know very cautious as he moves through so just try to i would try to you know, hone in on that security cover uh, to try to get closer to that deer yeah that's really good i, w- I want to throw this question out for you guys um it, my mind has has shifted on this and changed on this over the last couple of years. There is an element during the rut where there is just that randomness, right? Like you may have a buck on your property that you've been watching all year. He gets on a hot doe um, and he's gone for a couple of days. You just don't see him. Or uh, he's in search and next thing you know, he leaves your property and he shows up on somebody else's camera three miles down the road. Like, yes, that that absolutely happens. There is randomness. But I also, a couple of years ago, and this was the first time that this had really happened to me during this like peak of the rut time frame. And I think this was between November 7th and November 14th. I had four encounters with the same buck and he, he busted me every single time. So I missed him one time. He winded me once. He saw me once. Um, and then the last one, he kind of came in and he get like that sixth sense kind of got him. And he's just kind of like, uh, I don't like this. And just kind of like backed out of there. Um, But he was doing the same thing every couple of days, passing through the same exact area. And I was set up on different angles, obviously. But seeing him do the same thing at like the same time in the morning, it was like 10, 10 10.30 in the morning, I was catching him doing some of this. What do you guys think when it comes to pattern ability versus that kind of free-for-all mentality when it comes to the rut? Do you think it's an absolute free-for-all or do you think there's maybe a little bit that we can, you know, hone in on? So I I think it it goes back to the personality of that deer, you know, and, and radio collar studies have proven this, you know, some of them, you know, it's in their personality to roam, you know, and Mississippi state did a really good job on this. And there's a lot of, a lot of information out there. You know, they had one that would travel, you know, close to 19 miles away every single year. And he would, he would leave and he would swim the Mississippi river and he would come back to the exact same spot every single year. And then there's some deer that won't even cross a slip, you know, and it, so it, it's, it's amazing the different, you know, personalities that are out there. So yes, there is randomness to some bucks, but then some other ones, there, it's not random at all. Some of them don't rut as hard as others. Um, my, my experience and, and sometimes like you're saying, like, you know, if you do get a buck that you've never seen before and he's just passing through, I get really aggressive on that buck because if, if he hits my Intel, you know, if he's pinging my cameras, I'll, I'll move in on him immediately. I'll drop everything I'm doing because he may only be on your property for an hour. He may be there for a day, but I've killed several really nice bucks by, you know, that I've never seen before in my life, but I get aggressive on those type bucks, those type personalities. I'm still more, a little bit laser focused and, and precision on, you know, my resident. If he's still there, biggest deer I ever killed in my life was so tight. And he, he just, he was paying all the time and he was so consistent through the rut that I, I didn't even worry about him. And he was seven years old. He was a survivor, you know, always bet on the survival of these mature bucks. It's those right. three and a half year olds that, that are going to get popped. You know, <laughs> they're your teenager, you know, they're the invincible ones. They're the ones cruising the food plots. They're the ones that are responding to your rattles, you know, or your calls. They're going to be the first to show on the scene and they get popped, you right. know, so yeah. Yeah, that's really, really good. Um, I want to ask a question that comes to herd management and what we're harvesting or not harvesting on our specific properties. I hear folks say sometimes like, hey, and, you know, this is kind of the old school way of thinking, like, I want to have as many does as possible on my property because it's the does that bring the bucks. So I don't want to shoot any does in the early season. I don't want to shoot any does before the rut. Uh, I may not even want to shoot any does after the rut, right? Because I want bucks on my property. And if I've got a bunch of does, the bucks will be in here looking for them. Uh, I'm curious to hear maybe how you guys would respond to that. 
I'll just I'll jump in on that. It uh, this is kind of a loaded question, and I, I would say there's a lot of right answers to this one. Uh, but to me, it really depends on your area. Uh, if you have an area like I hunt multiple properties here in Michigan, and each one is totally different when it comes to the deer density. Uh, for example, the property here uh, where I live, we have uh, uh, a little over 50 acres here, but we have an extremely low deer density, extremely low. Uh, mm. We have, uh, this is not a joke, maybe five does that are using our property right now. Three of them, uh, doe, two fawns, another doe, fawn. And we have some bucks that come in every once in a while to, to check out the property, but this is not an area where I'm going to be harvesting does uh, at, at least right now because we just have a very low deer density and I want the, so I want these bucks when the when the pre rut and the rut starts I want them to come in here to you know search for does if if I don't if I shoot all my does in the early season then I will have none and then yeah. I, the, the, there's no reason for these deer to the bucks will come through they will come through they're going to check to see what's going on but they're going to quickly realize that there's nothing for them here and they're going to leave even if I have great food and great cover you know they still want to breed and, and so they're they're going to go down the road to an area with does on the flip side I also hunt a property with a ton of deer uh too many deer and Every year we try to shoot as many does as we can. I try to get with the neighbors. Let's try to, how many did you guys shoot? You know, let's try to take, take more does out of the herd here where we have just too many deer. And that does make for a kind of a, a tough rut because there's always a receptive doe. So these bucks don't really have to search as far before they find the next one. So you, you could be sitting all day and there, that buck might have already found, if he left a one doe, he might've already found the next one because he doesn't have to look very hard. That, that, so if you, you need to find a balance and it's, it's in between those two extremes. And uh, so if, it, it kind of, my answer again is it, it depends. It depends on the property. So, like yeah. I, the, some guys will say, shoot every doe you can, because then those bucks are going to be searching forever. But I've experienced it, even just trail cameras. Uh, my previous property that I owned for a couple of years had a, a low deer density too. The early in the in the rut, the bucks would be all over the place. And once the the once those like four does were bred, they were gone. I wouldn't I wouldn't get a single buck on camera for two weeks. And seriously, <laughs> oh uh, for two weeks, yeah, and th that's because there was no does. Like there's the, or the, the does were bred. They didn't they didn't have any reason to be there. But on the property with a ton of deer, the bucks are all over the place all the time. But again, they're harder to pattern because there's there's uh there's just too many does. So right, I don't know that that's right. been my experience with uh, hunting and and trail cameras like running uh, running them on these very I'm talking very low deer density areas. Right. Right. So I'll add to that, Josh, real quick. I totally agree with what Jake said. Uh, I love hunting these low deer density areas. Definitely in that, you know, I said my favorite, you know, if I had to pick only one week, it'd be post rut, but I, I am very passionate. I, and I love hunting that pre rut and it is very difficult when you're trying to get in on, you know, just a laser strike, you know, on, you know, close to a bedding area, uh, in that pre rut, if you've got, you know, a, a, a large deer density, you know, it, it's access is in and out. Like we talked about when, when you're, I, I have killed so many big deer on a property. It's not as extreme as what Jake said, but I have a, probably about five, you know, doe families and you can see them. They, they come out every day. They're, they're very patternable. You can see the nervousness. You can see the energy build as you get close to that pre rut. Um, as far as, as making those moves in on those, you know, high risk areas, the more intrusive areas, I like a lower deer density. You know, I just, that's my preference. Um, and they're way more responsive to calling. Um, when there's fewer does, uh, what, what I have experienced, like uh, I have three main properties, the ones that have the larger doe densities, man, it's very, it's very hard to get a, a mature buck to respond because there's so many receptive does uh, and vice versa man around here, you can really get them fired up, you know, in right. that, that later part of the, the, the rut, you can get pretty aggressive. So. Right. Right. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. One of the things that I've noticed too, we've got one, one property, um, that very, very high deer density. 
And when the rut rolls around, we see virtually no buck sign. The bucks are there. There's just very little buck sign because the number of does on this property, I mean, we've got three food plots on 35 acres and we'll have eight to 12 does a night in each of the food plots. So you figure 35 acres, there's 30 deer out there. And it's like, boy, that's a lot. That's a lot of deer. That's a lot of, a lot of does and uh, creating zero competition, you know, among the, among, among the mature bucks, right? Like the, the mature buck to doe ratio is, is very poor, very, very poor in this area. And uh, very little scraping activity, very little rubbing activity. And it just, it makes for a tough rut hunt. So, uh, Greg, you got anything to add? I don't think so. I think uh, I, it's it would all be pretty pretty similar to what you guys have covered. Yeah, very good. Yeah, very very situational. I'm glad you know Jake mentioned at the beginning. He's like, "That's a loaded question." I was like, "Perfect. That's exactly why I asked it." I want to want to have a loaded question for you out there. So, well, guys, before we wrap things up here, I want to ask you, what are your uh, maybe your best days of the rut? Like, what are the days that you're going to make sure that you are not going to miss being in the stand i'll go first my my favorite day to hunt is halloween and okay. i i think that's like with what uh, lee was saying like how he really likes to hunt those low deer density uh areas because it's once you get one of those receptive does you know all those bucks are fighting over that one receptive doe it can it can make for some pretty fun hunts and for my experience is even hunting in in a, in a high deer density area, hunting the very start of that rut. And for us, a lot of times that's right around Halloween where that first doe is coming into estrus or the first couple and the bucks are just going crazy. Like they're, they're making loops around the property. There, there was a couple of years ago where I had a, a, a buck. He was, he was doing, he did three loops around our property. He, he, he passed my stand three different times. It's like, Holy cow, here comes a deer. <laughs> Oh, that's that same buck. Like, how is he? How has he not gotten shot yet? You know, like he's a, he's making his rounds. But like that's that's my favorite time to be in the woods. Just when that first receptive doe, uh, you know, when, when she first comes in, just because that's gonna get all those bucks excited. And you you can be in a low deer density area, high deer density area. Like that that first doe, she's gonna she's gonna really get things going. Right. Right. Man, I, that was totally mine too. I, I I really like that that first receptive doe gets a lot of big bucks killed every year. Low deer densities, you can always see the energy building. You can see those immature bucks that kind of d- they don't know what it is. You know, they they start pushing the does a little bit too early. You know, your doe families. It's the it's the two does and the two fawns that come out there every day, and it's like okay, you know, the big buck, the mature buck, he knows when to move in on her, and it's coming. It's it's a couple days from then, so. Man, down here, you know, I really like that. Uh, if I had to, you, you, you're making us pick a week again. Um, I'm going to pick the week after Thanksgiving is the week I'm going to go because that's still at the tail. I'm a tail end guy, man. I, like if I had to just pick, I'm a, I'm the tail end. All I right. really like that. Man, so, pushing it down to the wire. Pushing it down the wire, dude. I kill, I'm telling you, if you try it, you, you won't knock it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the tail end. I, I just, I just really like it. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you, Greg. What about you? Uh, you know, I have a hard. I'm having a hard time picking one. Uh, is it okay if I do two? Because I'm having a hard no. Time. Okay, absolutely. No, nope. you All get right. you you get your hunting license revoked. Okay, so yeah. hmm, I would have to pick then the first calendar weekend in November uh, because. There's a lot of guys that come to the state of Ohio for their rut hunting trips, whether it be on public land and their lease or their private property. And on top of the deer just being more active and really moving around through the woods, all of this added human pressure, you bring that element into play and that stirs things up even more. Uh, Wherever a lot of these sanctuaries existed that these deer were spending a lot of their daylight hours are no longer a thing. Uh, because a lot of people don't take access into consideration. And I think that just really kicks things off. And um, I don't see a lot of people pulling all day sits in the areas that I hunt. And I feel like that first weekend of November between the time of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. have been some of my 
best times to be in the tree and the, the times that I see the most the most bucks on their on their feet uh, just for the collection of all those things. Gotcha. All right, I'm gonna let you have the second one. Second one uh, is just strictly based off of trail cameras, and this is when everybody goes home and leaves Ohio. Uh, and it's like that November 16th to the 20th range is a special time that I've always gotten on trail cameras. I've never been here because I always go up to our deer camp in the UP uh, for our Michigan's rifle season. But every single year I get the biggest bucks daylighting the most often on my trail cameras. And uh, it's actually made me adjust my rifle season strategy for the UP this year. It's uh, it's happened too many years in a row that enough is enough and I'm putting my foot down and I'd rather chase these big Ohio bucks around. <laughs> Man. Josh, what about you? We all answered what's yours. You're yeah. the extreme South guy. So. Yeah. So, uh, it really depends on where I'm at, man. So if I'm, you know, I hunt all over, but if I'm in Wisconsin, it's going to be that November 7th, 8th time frame. That seems to be when I start to catch some of those first couple of does coming in. Um, you know, it's a very exciting time here where I'm at in Georgia. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of fluctuation to our rut timing, but where I'm at, it's that November 13th, 14th, 15th time frame tends to be really, really good. Um, but then I think probably one of my favorite hunts of the year is our farm in Alabama where, you know, our rut, uh, February 4th is our day. We've killed a lot of bucks on February 4th and you know, a lot of people are like scratching their heads. Like, what do you mean rut in February? It's like, yeah, that's, we've, we've watched bucks chase does during turkey season when our turkey season used to start in March down there. So it's a, it's just a weird, it's a weird area. It's a strange place to be. We're not super far from the Gulf. And, uh, you know, the rut timing is just very, very weird down there. But, but yeah, so I'm, I'm going to go regionally dependent, but if I'm, if I'm sticking to the home, to the home farm, uh, February 4th is my day. That's the day I'm not going to miss. Interesting. So, yeah, you guys need to come down for a little uh little February rut action. Dude, I'm there. It, it's slow and trickly. You'll love it. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is not uh it is not what you're used to in a lot of places. It's it's more similar to, you know, if you hear folks talk about the rut down in Florida, um, you know, it's a little bit more drawn out. We don't have this sort of uh as steep of a bell curve of does coming into heat. It's more long drawn out over over a period of time and because we do have a buck to doe ratio that's very out of whack we do have a lot of does that aren't bred the first time around and so you do have a lot of deer in march you'll have another wave of deer coming into estrus and it's like all right here we go again and we're you know we're getting ready we're, we're scouting for turkeys and we're finding fresh scrapes all over the place and you know watching watching bucks chase those around but it's, uh, it's really cool, Josh, real, real quick, like the, the regional differences. I bet we're not just too far off on that sweet spot when we're all here sitting there talking. But that, that client I had, he had a really cool property in Louisiana. And it was it was like a niche little area. It was, uh, it was just real swampy. And the, the rut was extremely early right. in that area. Right. And I don't know if it has something to do with the flooding I, and just, you know, nature, you know, needing to drop those fawns at a certain, you know, uh, time of the year. But it was super early and it was, and it's just a little sliver in there. And he fell into that category and it was really neat to see the differences. Yeah. What do you mean by early? Uh, it, so his peak rut in that area, he said is around that first week of November, like right. the peak, that's right. the peak. Yep. Um, so, and you know, we were looking at trail cam pictures like, I'll be dang, you know, that's just wild. He was, he was weeks ahead of me. You know, and he's that far south. It's usually like you say, I mean, just a just an hour and a half south of me in Mississippi, man. Le, you know, middle late January is really hot. You yeah. know, and um, I figured down there it would be significantly later, but it just like, like almost like a Texas or something, and, and it wasn't. Right. You know, and that was really intriguing to me when I got to kind of read on. I was like, wow, it has to do something probably with the, the flooding, and I, I'm not sure, but that yeah. was really interesting. Yeah, they've it's got a little sliver. They've got a part of, of Louisiana, like the southwestern part of the state, is the very end of September, beginning of October is their peak rut. Oh, okay. And then no, this you, wasn't that early. So you get, yes, yeah, so that's, what, that's why I asked, what do you mean by early? Because there's, there's some weird stuff that goes on. South Florida, even. I talked to some guys down there a couple of weeks ago. Um, I say a couple of weeks ago at this point. It was, 
I guess a couple months ago, but they had just gotten done hunting the peak of their rut at the end of July and early August. You know, and I'm, I'm thinking of them, telling them, I'm like, dude, there's no way you're getting me out in the Everglades hunting deer in August. Like, it's just not, it's not happening. Like, I'm just not, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to move. I want to move to a different state. Sorry if you live in Florida around the Everglades, but I'm moving. Uh, anyway. All right, guys, anything else we need to leave the listeners with when it comes to hunting the rut? Uh, it's that time frame. I mean, basically you just need to get in a tree. Yeah, that's what I would say is just try to get out there as much as you can. Like, even if you think the weather isn't cooperating with you, like, like I think last year here in Michigan, I think probably around the country, we had a really warm rut. It was really warm, like 75 degrees. I don't know if we ever hit 80, but it was you know, 75 degrees in mid-November. And, you know, right. last year for us on our property, it was a little, little different, but we actually didn't hunt our property, I think from like November 1st until the 15th of November. So basically the first two weeks, there was nobody there. And going back and looking at the trail cameras, looking at your cell cameras as, as they coming in, like it, even it, with as warm as it was, those bucks were still on their feet during daylight the entire two weeks. So, I mean, this is like what you were saying too, like some bucks are, are really patternable during the rut. Like we had a buck last year. He, he was, he was all over the place. He was probably one of the, the oldest deer uh, in our neighborhood last year. He was on our property for that whole two weeks and in daylight all the time, just looking at your phone. Like you gotta be kidding me. There he is again. But so it just tells you like, just get in the woods. This, and on those, maybe those warmer days, maybe don't push in as far to those better stands, maybe hang back, you know, maybe sit one of those uh, hubs. Like it, Lee talks about that goes on and off your property, sit close to the edge but just, just be in the woods. And once you get that cold front move through, then maybe make it a more aggressive move, you know, push into uh, one of those uh, bedding areas and, and just sit as long as you can, because you, you never know when it could happen. All right. I think that's a good spot to end it. Good words from Jake there with Whitetail Partners, Michigan. Folks, thanks for listening.